Hi, welcome to episode 10 of Bigfoot in the News. This episode's a little bit longer than usual, so hopefully you can stick with it. I do have some exciting news I wanted to share, at least exciting for me. So after posting episode 9, I noticed uh, an increase in the views in that episode, which, which is great. Um, when I looked into the cause, I found that Sasquatch Chronicles podcast, which is my favorite podcast, had shared a link to the video on their website um, and had also subbed my channel. So that was really exciting to see. If you're not already um, familiar with the Sasquatch Chronicles podcast, you should check it out. If you're interested in Bigfoot, if you like hearing people tell their encounter stories, then it's definitely the podcast for you. So I listen to it as a podcast. It's also on YouTube. Um, I'll throw a link down below. Um, you should definitely check it out. All right, so the uh, articles in this episode are not as old as the prior episodes. They're from the 1960s and 1970s, but definitely very exciting encounters. Um, the third one is um, actually a, a fun surprise. I think everybody will be familiar with, with that, that encounter. Let's jump right in. This article is from 1977 out of Texas. Neighbors, some with tongue in cheek, listen today to stories about the so-called Holly Hymn, described as a hairy seven-foot-tall monster roaming the countryside. Three teenagers told of dodging rocks hurled at them Wednesday by the ape-like creature on a ranch outside Holly, a community five miles north of Abilene in west central Texas. Whatever it was, he looked kind of like an ape, but was still a man, said Larry Suggs, 15. He had huge arms. They hung to his knees. You'd have to see him to believe it. One of the rocks hit Suggs' right leg, he said, and others narrowly missed his companions, Tom Roberts, 14, and Renee McFarland, 15. Young Suggs and Roberts, who live at Abilene Boys Ranch, ran to the McFarland home after first sighting the creature. She returned with them packing a deer rifle and handed it to Suggs after the monster reappeared. She handed the gun to me and said, you shoot it, Suggs related. He fired from a distance of about 40 yards and apparently missed. He said, adding that the weapon's recoil knocked him off his feet. The teenager said the him, their name for the beast, went crashing away through almost impenetrable brush. They led others to a spot where foot-long prints marked the passage of something. Bob Scott, manager of Abilene Ranch, owns the place where Suggs and Roberts were working when they said the creature appeared. Scott said some sort of animal apparently is to blame for the disappearance of 21 goats off his land in recent days. Several carcasses were found later in the brush, he said. Sheriff's officers expressed a belief that coyotes killed some of the goats, but had no explanation for the complete disappearance of others. This article, titled, Gorilla-Type Animal Hunted in Caddo Area, is from 1964 out of Texas. The Caddo critter, an unidentified animal, possibly a gorilla, whose reported appearances Saturday caused Caddo area residents to arm themselves to the teeth, was not seen Sunday night. Everyone who has reported seeing the creature has given the same description to the sheriff's department. Everybody has said the thing is about seven feet tall, four feet wide, and covered with hair, said Mrs. Allen Roberts, reporter news correspondent at Caddo. Stevens County Sheriff Chase Booth and the Texas Highway Patrol joined with some 10 or 12 residents of the community 14 miles east of here Saturday night in a search for the animal, first reported seen early Saturday evening. A Caddo resident had unloaded his gun at the critter about 11.30 p.m. Saturday, but apparently failed to hit it. Some Breckenridge residents have theorized that the wandering animal might be an escapee from a game preserve, which had been maintained on Possum Kingdom Lake by the late F. Kirk Johnson of Fort Worth. All right, this next encounter is an exciting one and one that I think most of you should be familiar with. It's from 1967. A Yakima, Washington man 
and his Indian tracking aide came out of the wilds of northern Humboldt County yesterday to breathlessly report that they had seen and taken motion pictures of a giant humanoid creature. In colloquial words, they have seen Bigfoot. Thus, the long sought answer to the validity and reality of the stories about the makers of the unusually large tracks lie in the some 20 to 30 feet of colored film taken by a man who has been eight years himself seeking the answer. And as Roger Patterson spoke to the Times Standard last night, his film was already on its way by plane to his hometown for processing while he was beside himself relating the chain of events. Patterson, 34, has been eight years on the project. Last year he wrote a book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? This year he has been taking films of tracks and other evidence all over the Northwest United States and Canada for a documentary. He has over 50 tapes of interviews with persons who have reported these findings and including talks with two or three persons who have reported seeing these giant creatures. Bob Gimlin, 36, and a quarter Apache Indian and also of Yakima, has been associated with Patterson for a year. Patterson has visited the area before and last month received word of the latest discovery of the giant footprints which have become legend. Last Saturday they arrived to look for the tracks themselves and to take some films of these, riding over the mountainous terrain on horseback by day and motoring over the roads and trails by night. Yesterday, they were in the Bluff Creek area, some 65 to 70 miles north of Willow Creek, where Notice Creek comes into it. They were some two miles into the canyon where it begins to flare out. Patterson was still an excited man some eight hours after his experience. His words came cascading out between gasps. He still couldn't believe what he had seen, but he is convinced that he has now seen a Bigfoot himself and he's the only man he's heard of who has taken pictures of the creature. Here is what he reported. It was about 1.30 p.m. The daylight was good when he and Gimlin were riding their horses over a sandbar where they had been just two days before. They had both just come around the bend when I guess we both saw it at the same time. I yelled, Bob, look it. And they're about 80 or 90 feet in front of us this giant humanoid creature stood up. My horse reared and fell, completely flattening a stirrup with my foot caught in it. My foot hurt, but I couldn't think about it because I was jumping up and grabbing the reins to try to control the horse. I saw my camera in the saddlebag and grabbed it out, but I finally couldn't control the horse anymore and I, let, and I and had to let him go. Gimlin was astride an older horse, which is generally trail-wise, but it too reared and had to be released, running off to join their pack horse, which had broken during the initial moments of the sighting. Patterson said the creature stood upright the entire time, reaching a height of about six and a half to seven feet and an estimated weight of between 350 and 400 pounds. I moved to take the pictures and told Bob to cover me. My gun was still in the scabbard. I'd grabbed the camera instead. Besides, We'd made a pact not to kill one if we saw one unless we had to. Patterson said the creature's head was much like a human's, though considerably more slated, and with a large forehead and broad, wide nostrils. Its arms hung almost to its knees, and when it walked, the arms swung at its sides. Patterson said he is very much certain the creature was female, because... When it turned toward us for a moment, I could see its breasts hanging down and they flopped when it moved. The creature had what he described as silvery brown hair all over its body except on the face around the nose and cheeks. The hair was two to four inches long and of a light tint on top with a deeper color underneath. She never made a sound. She wasn't hostile to, to us, but we don't think she was afraid of us either. She acted like she didn't want anything to do with us if she could avoid it. Patterson said the creature had an ambling gait. As it made off over the some 200 yards, he had it in sight. He said he lost sight of the creature, but Gimlin caught a brief glimpse of it afterward. But she stunk. Like, did you ever let in a dog out of the rain? And he smelled like he, he'd been rolling in something dead. Her odor didn't last long where she'd been. Late last night, Patterson was anxious to return to the campsite where they had left their horses. He had been to Eureka in the afternoon to airmail his film to partner Al Diatli in Yakima. 
Diatley has helped finance Patterson's expeditions. He and Gimlin were equally anxious to return to the primitive area. It's right in the middle of the primitive area for the chance to get another view and more film of the creature. He said this strong belief that a family of these creatures may be in the area since footprints of 17, 15, and 9 inches have been reported, found. The writer jested that the sizes put him in mind of the story of the three bears. This was no bear, Patterson said. We have seen a lot of bears in our travels. We have seen some bears on this trip. This definitely was no bear. Patterson is also anxious today to telephone his experience to a museum administrator who is also extremely interested in the project. He may want to bring down some dogs. We don't have dogs here. He's not sure how much longer they will remain in the area. It all depends. And here's the famous frame 352 from the Roger Patterson footage. If you haven't seen the full film in a while, you should take a look on YouTube. There's some really good stabilized versions, and there's also some really good analysis videos. This, my friends, is a real Bigfoot. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for taking the time to watch. I really do appreciate it. You can find the link to my channel and to all the other episodes in the description below. Thanks again.